Hi, I'm Renevel DeMillo. Welcome to Asian American Life. Happy Lunar New Year. I'm inside the Chatham Square Library in Chinatown where they're celebrating the Year of the Dragon with a special photo exhibit by a journalist who grew up right here in Chinatown. Shirley Ng has spent most of her life taking photographs, capturing the big and small events of her neighbors and community. Some of her favorite photographs are now on display in the library she used to frequent as a child. Up next on Asian American Life, edible art, Michelin star pastry chef redefines desserts, plus ballroom dancing. Award-winning author Patricia Park debuts her new YA novel. And we sit down with Kevin Kim, New York's Commissioner of Small Businesses. Move over Count Basie, George G. Orchestra is swinging. This and more on Asian American Life. It wouldn't be Lunar New Year without dessert, and you might just impress your guests with these artistic confections. I'm Kyung Yoon. It's not often that we think of food as art, but that's the vision of pastry chef Unji Lee, the founder of Lise, a pastry art gallery here in the Flatiron section of Manhattan. Step inside this dessert destination in New York City, where the pastries take center stage, displayed like works of art in a museum. I'd like to create something uh, different than bakery or pastry cake shop. So I wanted to make a pastry gallery. So that's why we have separate floor. The first floor is for dining, but the second floor has the feel of a gallery space where customers can look around, take photos, and purchase items for takeout. It's the concept of the acclaimed pastry chef Unji Lee, who opened Lise in 2022, hoping to create desserts that melded her unique background and influences. I was born in Korea, so I have Korean heritage, and then I grew up in France as a professionally, so I have like French techniques and then knowledge, ingredients, and then I moved to New York, and I, since I love this city, I like the cookie dough, pecan, caramel, like those type of things. I really enjoyed it as well. So I wanted to combine Korea, France, and New York because that makes my identity and that makes me unique. Chef Lee's most popular desserts are her signature lise, made with caramel, Korean brown rice cake, cream, mousse, and pecan, as well as this best-selling playful confection made with corn mousse, corn cream, and corn cake. I wanted to be a pastry chef when, since I was like 14 years old, and I really liked the art at the same time. So for me, it was amazing, like perfect job that I dreamed because it's a, I, I'm, we can make an art, but also we can eat. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a perfect thing to deliver the happiness with eating. The future chef left Korea for France when she was 19 years old, where she studied, trained, and perfected her technique for more than a decade under some of the top French pastry chefs. Along the way, she met and married fellow pastry chef Mathieu Lobry before bringing her talents to New York in 2016 as the pastry chef at the Michelin-starred Korean restaurant Tongshik. There, for five years, she dazzled diners with her innovative desserts before taking the leap, together with her husband, to open Lise in 2022. We worked like 20 hours per day, and then we didn't, sometimes we didn't sleep, but it was fun because he was there and we supported each other. From the start, the couple wanted to incorporate Korean influences and not just in the pastries. Lise's understated decor includes mother-of-pearl walls, stones, a wooden pillar, and other architectural materials from Korea. I hope that people come here, live with a special experience and a great memory. And at the end, when they taste our sweets, it brings them the sweet happiness. That's my quotation to as a pastry chef, that I want to make more people happier. And Chef Unji says her vision is for more New Yorkers to not only get a taste of Korea through her creations, 
but a true experience, an understanding of different cultures that make New York so unique. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. Author Patricia Park puts a little-known community in the spotlight in her YA novels, The Korean Latinx Community in Queens. The two central characters are teenage Korean Latinas who are trying to navigate multiple identities. Inside the world's borough bookshop, you'll find rows of books written by authors as diverse as the people of Queens. And it's where you'll find imposter syndrome and other confessions of Alejandra Kim. Alejandra is a Korean Argentine American teen, born and raised in Queens, uh, here in Jackson Heights. What's up? Where we're at the World's Row <laughs> Bookshop. Um, and she she goes to Quaker Oats Prep. And as a Queens kid, she is fish out of water um, at, at Quaker Oats. Alejandra finds herself struggling to fit in, whether it's in her own Queens neighborhood or her politically correct prep school, which is very white and very privileged. When you have a name like Alejandra Kim, teachers always stare at you like you're a typo on the attendance sheet. Each school year, without fail, they look at my face and the roster and back again, like they can't compute my super Korean face and my super Spanish first name. Multiply that by eight periods a day and boom, welcome to my life at Quaker Oats Prep. Ale is what they call her back home, but then at school, she's like, you know, she's just trying to make things easy for everyone else, right? So at Quaker Oats Prep, she tells everyone, just call me Allie, you know, because again, she's accommodating. And I think this is an experience that for me as, as a child of immigrants, as a BIPOC woman, um, I've had to often accommodate myself to spaces. Like her character, Park's family has a connection to Latin America. Her grandparents emigrated to Argentina from South Korea in the 1960s. At the time, South Korea needed to ease overcrowding. Meanwhile, countries like Argentina needed the labor force. There is a part of Argentina called Little Korea built by Koreans who crossed halfway around the world with nothing but their bare hands. At one point, there were 50,000 Koreans in Argentina. Many, like Park's parents, moved to the U.S., and it was in Queens where her mom and dad met. Imposter Syndrome is Park's second novel. Her debut novel is the critically acclaimed adult book, Re Jane. For her second book, the author decided to enter another layer in her multiverse, The Struggles of Gen Z. I really love the freshness of the YA voice. There's something about being dropped into a young person's experience, a teen experience, and, and having everything unroll hot and in real time. And I also have to thank my students. I, I'm a professor at American University, and a lot of my students in both you know, the undergrad creative writing program and our MFA creative writing program were really interested in YA. They were reading YA, they wanted to write YA. And a character we briefly meet in Imposter Syndrome will be fully realized in her next book, What's Eating Jackie O, a Korean-American whose family is also from Argentina. She's a, a teen from Queens, uh, Korean-American. She goes to Bronx Science, and she's flunking out. She is like the anti-model minority. And in fact, right on the first page, she's like, I'm done being your model minority. Uh, and her passion is cooking. Park wrote the book during the height of the pandemic and the spike in anti-Asian hate. I really felt it, um, especially in the pandemic, this, this kind of wave of, of hate. I don't feel safe being on the subway. Again, I'm a born born New Yorker. Like, it takes a lot to phase me. And, um, uh, and, and this fear has been echoed by so many people in my community. This is a reality that many AAPI still face today. While the FBI is reporting a decrease in anti-Asian hate crimes, Asians are saying otherwise. According to AAPI data, about 2 in 10 Asians say they have experienced being verbally harassed or abused in the last year, and 22% have been called a racial or ethnic slur. About 1 in 10 say they have been physically assaulted or threatened. Anti-Asian hate can't be ignored or brushed aside, Park said, whether it's in a YA book or if you're witness to it. Don't You're call racist. me China woman. The woman had been verbally harassing another Asian woman on the subway. When Park, a bystander, said something, the woman turned on her and Park started to record. I was taught not to make waves, right? Um, just keep your head down, metaphorically, just do your thing. 
move on, you know. Later, she flagged the police, but they tried to talk her out of filing a report. But she ignored them because in the end, she didn't want to be silenced like many others before her. I think I've reached a point where I'm, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of people in my community being attacked. I'm tired of, I don't know, like we talked about earlier, having to apologize for your existence. For Asian American Life, I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We all know that ballroom dancing is a thing among our Asian American seniors. So I went to New York City's Chinatown to find out why so many find sanctuary in movement. It's 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning, and these seniors are floating on their feet inside the Imperial Ballroom, right in the heart of New York City's Chinatown. It's a lot of people today. Oh, they're happy, yeah. happy Sunday. Irene Eng and Ming Chao have managed the Imperial Ballroom for more than 28 years. It's amazing that this class is, this group is so energetic. They come seven days. Yeah. It all started on the dance floor, of course. I was looking for a teacher, and then he come and he said, oh, I'm a teacher, so I learned from him. What did you think of him as a dancer when you first met him? I think he was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was pretty good looking, too. <laughs> now this is my wife. <laughs> Ming Chao, who immigrated from Vietnam to pursue a dance career, and Irene Eng, an immigrant from Malaysia, tangoed their way through competitions and performances in the tri-state area before they opened the Imperial Ballroom in 1992. He just loved dancing. He yeah. couldn't imagine what to do besides dancing. In Vietnam, he was already dancing. Of course, when he arrived, he has other jobs, but his heart is always dancing. That's why we open studio. So you have a space to teach. One. And they continue to teach. Uh, one, two, three, uh, one, two, three. Uh. Now we have Cuban rap. The simple steps that we teach. Uh, Alemana, yeah. hand, hand to hand. So when you dance, what, do you, what goes through your head? What goes through your mind? Uh, what do you feel? What do I feel? Yeah, when you're dancing together. <laughs> we feel joy. We feel sometimes we feel love. Depends on uh, what dance we're doing. Depends on what yeah. day, huh? Yeah, yeah what dance? From beginning, we feel love. Yeah, depends what dance. Sometimes the walls, the music, it depends. But we always find joy in dancing. Always. The folks here, mostly immigrants from China's Fujian province, are finding joy too. We are recognized as the studio that never closes. The only time we closed were during the pandemic for 15 months that we are forced to, to close. At this sanctuary of movement and grace, the troubles of the world are apparently left strictly off the dance floor. They come every day, but they no talk, nobody talk about. As to why ballroom dance studios are so popular among Asian American seniors, Irene has a theory. We are mostly immigrants. When immigrants come to uh, another country, they work very hard. They only take care of their family, taking care of the kids. They have no time for themselves. When the kids grow up, and then they try to think for some a new hobby for, for, for themselves. Dancing is, is the most healthy for them. Then they meet a lot of new friends, mix and mingle, and then they dance together. And then they will go out together for dim sum. It's, very, it's a very nice day to come. And decades of fun for the pair who followed their passion in the hustle of their dancing shoes. They're sure to cha-cha for decades more to come. We're proud that we, we like, like we made it in America, that we are, we are successful in the dance business. When the sex music starts, I'm like dancing, <laughs> working and dancing. It's like, what, what, what job can you, can you do that? <laughs> the Imperial Ballroom is open seven days a week in New York City's Chinatown. For Asian American Life, I'm Rainer Ramirez.
I'm Vivian Lee. There are nearly a quarter million small businesses in the five boroughs of New York City. And the task of helping them to navigate the regulatory landscape in the city, funding opportunities, and helping them to make money falls on the New York City Department of Small Business Services, led by its commissioner, Kevin Kim. I see all these immigrant business owners, all these um, just business owners in general, just struggling in the beginning. It's a struggle this attorney and entrepreneur turned public servant knows firsthand. Kevin Kim watched his parents start a business from scratch after the family immigrated from South Korea to a one-bedroom apartment in Queens when he was five. They didn't speak English very well, so to make a living, they came here and started a small business like so many other immigrants. And my mother would design artificial flowers, and then my father who actually had a law degree from Seoul National University in Korea, but never actually became a lawyer, he would take her designs, get on the 7 train, and go into the garment district and knock on doors of wholesalers, hoping that they would buy her designs. Kim attended public schools, including the Queens College-based Townsend Harris High School. After earning degrees at Stanford and Columbia, Kim turned a small company into an accredited one for English language learners. He also co-founded a mental math tutoring program. That experience from watching my parents who got zero government resources, from my personal experience, having going through regulatory compliance, which is complicated for anyone, and I had a law degree, um, I think that's what's really motivated me to understand from where I sit now how much I can actually help entrepreneurs of all backgrounds. They don't know where to access capital. They don't know how to access any government resources. Kim's job is to change that from hitting the morning talk shows. If you do have the information, who's ready to apply right away? You gotta have your business in order. Exactly. And your accounts and everything. To visiting council districts and commercial hubs. This FaceTime with small business owners across the city who employ nearly half a million workers and pump about $200 billion into the economy leads to new tools like the My City chatbot for entrepreneurs. You're able to open up an AI chatbot and just type in, for example, how do I open a restaurant? And 24-7, you'll never be put on hold. It just gives you everything you need. And the NYC Funds Finder, a one-stop shopping site in 10 languages for entrepreneurs looking for microfinancing sources at all levels of government. Kim is also on President Biden's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, with a focus on economic equity for the AAPI community. Kim is also a CUNY trustee, one of the numerous nonprofit positions he's taken on in New York. Well, CUNY is the single most incredible social mobility engine that's out there. CUNY boasts over 20% AAPI students and approximately 15, 16% faculty and staff as well. All those numbers just show such a diverse community that AAPI voices need to be heard. Which brings him back to how it all began, his parents. Their intrinsic motivation was around this idea that their children would be able to do more for others. And they always considered public service to be the highest calling. For Asian American Life, I'm Vivian Lee. From high school jazz band to a fixture here at Swing 46, George G. brings a big band blast to the ballroom. For almost three decades, George G. and his swing orchestra have kept things in motion here at Swing 46 Jazz and Supper Club in Times Square. Are you the only uh, Asian American big band leader? Well, uh, my publicist, me, says that I am the only professional Asian American big band leader in the world. A self-crowned title G wears proudly after 44 years of rocking the swing scene with his big band, the George G. Swing Orchestra, a unique lifelong passion born of familial bonds. 
I guess in my formative years as a teenager here in New York City, I used to listen with my dad to a radio program called WNEW. And they were the hosts of a, a program called the Make Believe Ballroom, where they would feature the big band sound. The sounds of like Sinatra, or Glenn Miller, Count Basie, Duke Eldon, and all the great American jazz big bands. And that was a connection that my dad, a veteran from World War II, he would inform me about all the times that he would listen to that music and was exposed to it. And I spent a lot of time with my dad listening to those, that program. And it really inspired me to like the music and dream about being a band leader one day. And that love for the big band blossomed in high school. I wanted to play in a symphony orchestra. I played string bass, upright bass, uh, but they didn't have room for another bassist. So my music director, he said, George, we have a spot in the stage band, which is another name for a big band. In college, the big band enthusiast continued to pursue his passion by bringing the antiquated American art form to the school's radio station. In that era of punk rock and new wave, I started my own make-believe ballroom. And I did a program, all that music, and I you know, thought about all that times that I listened to it with my dad, and it became wildly popular. And this is back in the late 70s, and no one was interested in big band swing jazz. That's where the budding band leader met his idol and mentor, the king of swing, Count Basie, who inspired him to start his own band. A challenge at first as the Asian American band leader was rebuffed by many. Being Chinese American, Asian American, I was not accepted in old school Pittsburgh uh, when I started playing performances at uh, country clubs and, 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 and different private events and that was not used to a mixed organization of musicians. So I kind of think back in the early 80s or so, I broke a lot of that barrier and it took a long time but G eventually won over his audiences, honing his craft, using advice from his mentor. Count Basie told me, watch the audience, and you see one guy or one folk snapping their fingers or tapping their toes, then you know you're doing the right thing. Words of wisdom, G says, helped him discover that chemistry between the band and audience makes the music come alive. When you play for dancing, it's very interactive. It's not, there's not a barrier between the stage and the dance floor. And that's where G comes in, acting as he puts it, as the traffic cop of the stage, directing the dynamics of the performance and channeling the energy of swing time music. The big band is a true American art form. It originated in the 30s and the 40s here in the US of A during wartime era, uh, specifically for dancing at that time. And usually the, the typical big band instrumentation is five saxophones, uh, four trombone, four trumpets, and a rhythm section of bass, piano, drums, and guitar, uh, and also vocalists to handle the, the singing. G's band is scaled back from 17 to 12 instruments, but still has the same big band sound. So a big band is not just a loud sound, but it's a full sound. It takes advantage of all the, the chordal structure and makes sure that is a core and response between the brass and the reed section. Although G is a fixture at New York City venues, he also plays worldwide, where he says a good portion of his audience is often Asian. When I travel the country and the world doing events, um, sometimes I look at the dance floor and I, I'm so I'm proud and happy that it's so supported by Asian Americans that love to dance. And, you know, and it's sometimes it's more than 50% of the audience. Uh, I can't figure out why, but I suspect that it's a good chance for them to let their hair down. Growing up, I feel like, you know, the Asian American culture, as beautiful as it is, is a little bit more restrictive than um, American culture, I guess. And swing music and the dancing that Lindy Hop gives the uh, folks a chance to kind of move their body in a way that you don't normally move. And G has inspired countless to move their bodies, playing the oldies while keeping up with the times. His band just recorded a new album, Winter Wonderland, available now. The George G. Swing Orchestra performs every Sunday night at Swing 46 from 9 to midnight. For Asian American Life, I'm Susan Jun.
That's our show for now. If you want to learn more about these stories, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Asian American Life. And come by the Chatham Square Library in Chinatown to check out Shirley Ng's photos. And it's also where you'll find Patricia Park's novel. I'm Renavelle DeMillo. We'll see you next time.